Okay, I'm going to start this with an apology for yesterday's video, which I will not remove. Because I still meant what I said. But, um, I'm very angry. Um, one thing that I'm not, you know, I just don't want to tolerate people acting like they know more than me. It's getting really annoying. I have been involved in a lot of things for years. And, you know, for anybody to come act like they understand the geopolitical sphere better than me is insulting. You're insulting my intelligence by doing that. I've been around a lot of places and usually my predictions turn out to be the case because I'm watching the trends. It's no psychic crystal ball or anything. I just understand geopolitics. So uh, it's Friday and that means when the sun goes down it will be Shabbos or Shabbat. Shabbat in Hebrew, uh, Shabbos in Yiddish, which means Sabbath. So I want to show you um, a video which has been posted on my channel and other channels. You can find it on my channel. But I want to show you a video of Jewish Palestinians. Now the Jewish Palestinians uh, live in a, a community called Mer Sharim. Now for those of you who don't know this, Mer Sharim predates 1948. What's the relevance of this? 1948 is when the Zionist State of Israel was founded. A couple facts about Mer Sharim. Their primary language is not Hebrew. Their primary language is Yiddish. Now, they all speak Yiddish, and some of them also speak Arabic as well as Yiddish, but they all speak Yiddish. They are Palestinians. They had been acknowledged as Palestinian, and this was before 1948, and they always objected to the state of Israel. They will all die to the last man, woman, and child to protect their Palestinian heritage. And yet people like to act like the state of Israel, you know, and Palestine, they're just in some conflict. No, the state of Israel is a settler colonial country. It has nothing to do with the true Jewish diaspora nation. And the true Jewish diaspora nation is based on culture and religion. I've been saying this for years. I understand that this shits all over the Hegelian logic of nation state, but the nation state cannot be fixed. You have to get rid of the nation state. I mean, really, you should get rid of the state in general, but if that is not possible, we should at least get rid of the nation state. Now, there's, a, there's an underlying truth that a lot of people don't want to hear, and that's the reason why people don't want to talk about the liberation of Palestine and the acknowledgement of a Jewish diaspora nation and a denouncing of the falsities that is the Zionist state, the Zionist nation state of Israel, is because then that means that you have to put the United States in the same category. And it's true. The United States of America is a settler colonial country. The natives do deserve their land back. All that has happened is that land grab after land grab after land grab has taken away from the native, you know, peoples on these lands we call the Americas. Each treaty has been violated. The treaties are bullshit. The treaties don't matter. Just like the Oslo Accords in the Middle East, they did not matter. They still don't matter. What matters only is liberation or destruction. I choose liberation. That's why I've said nonviolence is Stockholm Syndrome. Now, I'm sure there's some confusion because there's a lot of misgivings about the Jewish peoples. Like, are you guys violent? Are you nonviolent? Neither, actually. We don't turn the other cheek. We are Jewish. But what we have is a concept I call non-aggression. This is why I don't like it when people um, don't let us take back words that are stolen, literally stolen from the right wing, because they're not from the right wing. Usually they're from radical religious people who find themselves on the left. And because that has to be trivialized by communists and anarchists alike, you know, then it doesn't matter. But this is exactly why there will never be a, any more of a successful Marxist revolution and why there's never been a successful anarchist revolution and there never will be. Because you don't appeal to the masses. What's going to happen when a, an abused proletariat takes power, you know, takes power, and then they become a new bourgeoisie? 
What stops them from becoming a new bourgeoisie? The only thing that I can think of is religiosity. But I'm sure that that's simplistic to, to, be, to everybody else. And that's because you forget that class and race are irrelevant compared to caste. They're both caste. That's the problem with your broken dialectics, is caste. It's all caste. It's not that race is caste and class is race or whatever. No, it's all the caste system. It's not the patriarchy. It's not this or that. It's the caste system. Race and class are just manifestations of the, of the caste system. And by the way, despite my disagreement with that chauvinistic using of the word patriarchy, I am not saying that there's not male chauvinist domination around the world. There is. So, I, I, uh, I mean, MGTOW is gay. I'll say it that way. MGTOW is gay. And that is not a slur on gay. I mean, gay can be... Gay is the new smurf, okay? I'm, I'm just going to start being open with where I'm coming from. Gay is the new smurf. You can't say smurf anymore because smurf has become a racial slur. But gay can be positive or negative depending on how you're saying it. So, for instance... Um, here's a thing that we say in PSFM, the white man is gay. What does that mean? Well, first of all, you have to understand that he's not, he's not white because he's gay. He's gay because he's white. In other words, it's all projection. Whether you're pro-homosexual, homophobic, or you are gay yourself, the fact of the matter is, is that this was never that big of a deal to a lot of people. I know that that's hard for people to swallow, but the- Swallow. <laughs> I said swallow, that's hilarious. I know that that's hard for people to digest. Damn. Such- you know, we have such vulgar language in our time. It's- it's amazing that our children are growing up so fucked up in the head. But anyway, um, it's hard for people to, to grasp, I'm sure. But it's really the white man that is obsessed with homosexuals, obsessed with trans people and all this. That's the white man's obsession. And whiteness is not about your skin color. The skin color just causes the nep nepotism. Whiteness is about power. That's what it is. That's why when you say white power, it is racist. And when you say white pride, it is racist. But when you say black power or black pride, you're actually saying revolution and liberation. So. I'm going to show you this video of the Jewish Palestinians as the Zionist settlers come and take away the Palestinian flags. Now, one of the reasons why this doesn't get the real coverage is because they're religious and they're not aggressive because genuine religious people are not aggressive. Some will believe in self-defense like the Muslims and they should. And it's not that Jewish people don't believe in self-defense. Like I said, it's that we're not aggressive you know, non-aggressive, and that gets back to what I said about right-wing, right-wings, right-wingers appropriating radical religious p terms, because non-aggression principle is used by the anarcho-capitalists. What are the anarcho-capitalists? Well, they're not anarchists, they're fascists, actually. Just like national socialist is not socialist, it's fascist. That's what fascists do. They use socialist terms. They particularly use socialist terms. Why do they do that? They do it because that way, they can bring people onto their side or take advantage of the confusion of the uneducated masses. And you know, it might surprise you to know, the class, since everybody likes the word class, the class that likes to be educated the most that wants education happens to be the lumpen proletarian. And I'm going to say something else. There is no first world proletarian. There isn't. Unless we're talking about black people, because who built all this shit? Black people did. They built it. That's what they did. They built it. And therefore, they are the proletariat. So, here's the video of Mayor Shireen. And these are the Jewish Palestinians which predate the Zionist state. Ja, 
Den de fanner, så de fanner, de fanner. Free, free Palestine, and uh, long live the Jewish diaspora. The state of Israel exists at the expense of both. Israeli forces have detained two relatives of the suspected Palestinian gunmen. The raid took place in the village of Nilin in the occupied West Bank. Let's get more with Nida Ibrahim, who joins us from Ramallah. So, uh, Nida, a raid in Nilin in the occupied West Bank following that shooting in Tel Aviv. Tell us what happened. 
People there told us that the Israeli forces have stayed there for six hours, uh, where confrontations erupted between Palestinians and Na'lin and the Israeli forces. We know that they've detained the father and the brother of the shooter, as well as taking measurements of the house in preparation for a house demolition. What happens in these cases that usually when there are Israelis who are killed, it's becoming a standard Israeli procedure to demolish the home of the shooters. Now, in this case, we don't have any uh, uh, killed people in the shooting in Tel Aviv yet, but uh, the, uh, usually this is the standard practice by the Israeli forces. Now, also, there was another incident elsewhere in the occupied West Bank where a Palestinian, a 21-year-old, was killed by Israeli forces, uh, sorry, by an Israeli settler. He was near an illegal Israeli settlement outpost, and according to witnesses, they say uh, they don't know what happened because the Israeli narrative is that he had weapons and uh, or at least knives and he tried to uh, attack the Isra an Israeli settler but we don't have a Palestinian narrative to counter that it's hard to know what happened but it's uh, uh, it's worth mentioning that the Israeli raids have been intensifying in the occupied West Bank the house demolitions as well the killings we're talking about 78 Palestinians who were killed by Israeli forces since the beginning of the year and we're only in the in March Indeed. Nida, thank you for that. Nida Ibrahim, live for us in Ramallah. So, um, yeah. Good Shabbos. Shabbat Shalom. Now we want to turn to our first story. Just terrible, terrible situation in Palestine. Uh, brutal attacks on Palestinians. Uh, maybe that's par for the course, but still brutal and outrageous. And as always, we are honored to be joined here by Ali Abu Nima, who's the director of Electronic Intifada, also the author of The Battle for Justice in Palestine. Ali, thank you so much for being back with us. Thank you, Eugene. Well, I was hoping we could just start, maybe you could give folks some context to this, uh, I'm always hesitant to call it an escalation, but let's just call it significant uh, outpouring of violence against Palestinians that we've seen uh, over the past week or so. Yeah, it's hard to find the right term because if we say uh, escalation or outbreak, it makes it seem as if normally there isn't violence. And I think the reality that we have to try to convey to people is that the violence is relentless. Uh, Israeli military occupation, Israeli settler colonialism, Israeli apartheid is 24-7, 365 violence against every Palestinian man, woman, and child everywhere all the time. They're never free from the violence. Um, what we've seen in the last since the beginning of the year is Israel has escalated its raids into Palestinian cities and refugee camps. Uh, it's killed almost 70 Palestinians still since the start of the year, and many of them in these massive daytime raids that have happened in cities like Jenin and Nablus. For example, in Nablus on February 22nd, a massive Israeli uh, army force went into the uh, very densely populated old city of Nablus in broad day daylight, guns blazing, firing indiscriminately, and killing uh, a dozen Palestinians and injuring a hundred more. This has been happening all over the place. And so quite predictably and inevitably, uh, there has been an upsurge in Palestinian resistance uh, this year, uh, so far, 13 Israelis have been killed in the context of violence. Seven of them were killed in a, a single shooting attack that came again uh, in response to uh, one of these massive Israeli raids on a Palestinian uh, community uh, in which multiple people were killed. So it's a cliche to talk about a spiral of violence or a cycle of violence because that erases the responsibility. But we can talk about a spiral of escalation. Uh, I don't know if that uh, metaphor even works, but uh, th there is sort of a, uh, 
a violence escalator. At the root of it is the violence of the Israeli occupation and settler colonial invasion of Palestinian land. That's what's driving it. And what you know, Ali. Leave... Those... Yeah, oh. sorry. No, no, no please. Sorry. I didn't want to interrupt you. Go ahead. I thought you were. Well, I wanted to no, ask that... you. <laughs> this is this is fun. You you go ahead, and then I'll go ahead. Let's do that. <laughs> Well, I just wanted to say that that's sort of the broad context for what uh, what uh, we saw in, in that brief clip, which is the settler pogrom in the village of Hawara, where two settlers were killed uh, a, week, a week ago on, uh, or was it, sorry, on Sunday. Uh, two settlers were killed in Hawara village. And then the Israeli army uh, allowed uh, hordes of settlers to pour into the town, uh, ransacking businesses, setting fire to homes, killing one Palestinian, uh, and taking their revenge. And all of this, it's important to note, because these image was, images were so shocking to people around the world that Israeli leaders started to say, oh, you know, uh, we'll, we'll we'll have to to put a stop to this sort of thing. This isn't what we intended. It is what they intended because prior to this pogrom and during the pogrom, top Israeli leaders were inciting it, praising it, saying that we want to see Hawara burned, we want to see the village destroyed. Bezalel Smotrich, the uh, Israeli finance minister. On, on the same Sunday when the two settlers were killed, said Israel should go mad on the Palestinians and start attacking Palestinian cities with tanks and helicopters. So the settlers were simply doing the bidding of the Israeli state. And I'm um, glad that you raised that because the response from the U.S. and the EU has been very much to try to condemn both sides, but in interestingly different ways. I actually want to show a clip of Ned Price being asked about this, if we could bring that up, and I'd like to get your reaction to it. Yes. Hi. Um, I there noticed in your tweet yesterday you referred to the shooting that in which two Israelis were killed as a terror or, te or terrorism whereas um, the settler violence was separated. Was that deliberate? And, and, and if yes, how do you differentiate or decide when to use the word terrorism versus when not to? I think it's best not to uh, parse and to, to go into definitions from the podium. Uh, we are condemning the extremist violence that we've seen over the past couple days. Uh, we issued a very strong condemnation of the killing of the Israelis that we've seen uh, over the weekend. Uh, we've issued today a very strong condemnation uh, of the violence that's resulted in the death of uh, Palestinian and the destruction uh, of property. In all of these cases, in all cases of extremist violence, uh, we think it's important that there be accountability, that there be uh, justice, equal justice under the law. So, Ali, I mean, that's, to me, you, what I see there is, Israelis, Israeli settlers committing acts of violence, committing a pogrom is just violence. And it's it's bad, but it's violence. Whereas Palestinians who live in the West Bank attacking settlers is terrorism. What do you have to say to that? Yes, that's consistent. It's it's uh, Israelis can't do terrorism. Only Palestinians can. According to both the United States and the European Union, because the European Union being the lapdogs of the United States, uh, you know, copy exactly what the Americans say and do. Uh, and so the, the, the EU position has been identical. But listen to what Ned Price said. He said, equal justice under the law. What, does, what law is he talking about, first of all? We're in occupied territory. Uh, where Israel is the military occupier. And under the Israeli military occupation, there is no equal justice under the law. Palestinians live under Israeli military rule and military orders, whereas the Israeli settlers live under Israeli civil law. So right there on paper, you have a separate and unequal system. You have an apartheid system. If you're an Israeli settler, you're not subject to military law you're subject to the Israeli civil system. If you're a Palestinian, you're subject to Israeli military law. But if you're a Palestinian, you don't get as far as the law. If you pick up a stone, you'll just be shot dead. Whereas the settlers, 
are treated with kid gloves. In fact, they're protected by the army while they are busy attacking Palestinians. And that's not just in Hawara, that's all the time. In fact, for example, you could go to the website of B'Tselem, an Israeli human rights group, or their YouTube channel. They have tons of videos going back years documenting Israeli settlers attacking Palestinians, attacking and killing Palestinian livestock, burning their property, destroying their trees, while the soldiers are watching and just, you know, protecting the settlers while they do this, uh, this job of vandalizing uh, Palestinian property and making Palestinian life hell on behalf of the Israeli state. The settlers are the uh, fist of the Israeli state of Israeli land theft and settler colonization. And that is absent from the, the language of the State Department. And when he talks about equal justice under the law, who's going to bring this equal justice? The military occupier? I mean, we're coming up. I can't believe how fast we're coming up. It will be on May the 11th, the first anniversary of the cold-blooded murder on live television of Shirin Abu Akleh, a U.S. citizen, uh, and the correspondent of Al Jazeera. Has there been justice for Shirin Abu Akleh? On the contrary, the United States government helped Israel cover up her deliberate murder. And this has been the policy of the Biden administration, of the Democratic Party, that the more extreme, the more violent, the more fanatical Israel shows itself to be, the more the Democrats do to cover it up. The more that the, the Joe Biden does and Anthony Blinken do to cover it up, and to try to blame Palestinians for it and tell Palestinians, you guys, you need to calm down. You need to calm down and restore calm. While they're shipping every weapon in the American stockpile to Ukraine so Ukrainians can fight back against Russia, they're telling Palestinians, you just need to calm down and take it. And if you lift so much as a rock in the face of your invaders, and your occupiers, then you're a terrorist, and they have the right to shoot you dead. This is the reality. It's a reality that, that I don't think any people in the world would accept, but Palestinians are told, just calm down and accept it. And if you're good, if you, if you behave well, maybe we'll give you a, a couple of million more dollars for health clinics in refugee camps, where you're going to live forever, by the way, because we're never going to support justice for you so that you can go back to your homes. Mm. No, I, it's uh, <laughs> no lies detected. I mean, I, I, for sure. I mean, it's unbelievable, almost like the, the fairy tale nature of some of this, the way it's, I remember during the great March of return, you know, people are peacefully marching, getting sniped down. And then when Israel's being criticized, it's like, well, there's terror kites being flown. And it's just so absurd that you would think like, this is so laughable, but it's allowed to, to, you know, play out in the media. Uh, and, and certainly if you want to comment on that, I'm, I'm happy to hear. But one thing I want to also ask your, your thoughts on Ali is, it seems that the the resistance in Palestine, especially amongst young people, uh, is also strengthening majorly. I mean, I'm seeing all these videos of these night marches of people coming out, the calls from Lions Den from people to resist. Now I see the PA trying to catch up at the last second and say they want to, they're going to do something too. So I wonder how you also evaluate, uh, you know, the, what seems to me to be almost a generational changing of the guard here uh, of Palestinians really coming out in a powerful way. I think you know. Let's step back and look at the big picture, because the particulars of, of what, what's been happening now can only be understood against the bigger picture. Since Israel was established by force and illegitimately over the ruins of hundreds of Palestinian towns and villages, Israel has tried to subdue the indigenous Palestinian population with every violent method regular massacres, which we've seen throughout the West Bank, in Gaza, even of Palestinians within uh, so-called Israel, uh, home punitive home demolitions, revenge demolitions, a tactic which is reserved for Palestinians. Israel will never demolish the family home of a Jew who murders a Palestinian. 
that punishment is, is reserved only for the families of Palestinians, collective punishment. A very savage method, always used by colonial regimes, is if we make the natives suffer enough, eventually they will accept their subordinate position and stop resisting. So murder, imprisonment, torture, home demolitions, uh, aerial bombing, uh, anything, Israel has done it. And 75 years after the Nakba, the ethnic cleansing of Palestine, the Palestinian people are not subdued. And remember, the Israeli justification for these murderous raids in Jenin, in Nablus, in Hebron, wherever it is, is, oh, this is to thwart terrorist attacks. Well, the very next day, Palestinian resistance groups can carry out uh, uh, sophisticated operations against Israel. And an even more uh, common phenomenon is uh, these individual uh, actions by Palestinians, uh, Palestinians picking up a knife or picking up a gun and going to get, uh, you know, to going to retaliate, or you could say get revenge. Israel cannot stop it. In fact, everything Israel does fuels it. And so what we see is a frustration in the settler state that, look, we've done everything to these people and they're still fighting back. So it's a constant escalation of Israeli terror, of Israeli collective punishment with the aim of, of subjugating this people who refuse to be subjugated. So when you uh, look at the, this, uh, this young generation, they're undeterred. They are undeterred, but they also have no choice because, you know, people are already living in refugee camps like Aqba Jaber or Arub or, uh, or uh, the, the camps across the West Bank, which Israel is raiding, Sha'afat camp. The Palestinians, okay, we're already in refugee camps. What do you want from us? No, they're still sending in the army and attacking people in refugee camps and killing them and carrying out extrajudicial executions. So... It's not as if people have a choice but to fight back and defend themselves. That's what Palestinians are doing. They have a right to fight back. They have a right to defend themselves. And who are all these people in the West to quibble with them? People who are okay with Israel using anti-tank missiles in the middle of the old city of Nablus. People who are okay with Israel using high-powered sniper rifles against children at the Great March of Return. Uh, that uh, and they're quibbling with the Palestinians throwing stones. Are you kidding me? Then send the Palestinians precision guided missiles so that they can take out the Israeli military bases and the military military command posts where these attacks against them are being planned. But Palestinians are left alone against a merciless nuclear armed enemy, and then they're being lectured from the West. Oh, you mustn't do this, you mustn't do that. Palestinians won't take those lectures from people and they will fight back with the means they have. And uh, the escalation is coming only from the occupier and the invader. This conflict would be over tomorrow if, Pal if Israel were to respect the rights of Palestinians, were to respect international law and were to respect uh, the right to self-determination of the Palestinian people. But the reality is this. If Palestinians stop resisting, they will be wiped out. If Israel stops attacking them, there will be peace. Well, Ali, that, is, is, that is, very is very true. And I appreciate you, as always, being willing to join us and help us sort through all of this. And I hope everyone is following the electronic intifada, which I think is necessary reading. But thanks again for giving us some of your time here on the Freedom Side. Thank you.